Hi guys, welcome back to Scylla's Podcast and today I have for you a halfway monthly-ish wrap-up uh, because I realized I read too many books in a month and a good reading month for me um, and I, I cannot let you sit through one wrap-up video a month and um, unless I just say one sentence per book and that's not gonna happen so halfway done with the month here we go <laughs> I've stuck fairly close to the TBR I set myself which I'm very proud of um, but before we get into those let's quickly talk about the ones um, that I'm currently in the middle of um, so first off we have this one is actually from my, my TBR. We have The Witchwood Crown by Ted Williams. This is a reread for me, but I um, I found out I don't really remember anything that happened in the book. So it's technically not a reread, I guess. I am, as you can see, I've gotten a fairly chunk into this. I am on page 450 out of about 700. Um, I have good feelings about this. I think I'm going to finish this maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Um... It has a very different vibe than the first series that is set in Austin Art, which is Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. And while Ted Williams does say that you can just pick up The Last King of Austin Art without having read the first series that is set in Austin Art, I personally don't really recommend it unless you plan on never picking up Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, because you will be thoroughly spoiled for that. Because this is set about 30-ish years after the first series takes place. Um, it has a very different feeling to it because in the first series we mostly follow Simon who is one of those very typical um, farm boy slash in this case uh, kitchen boy turned hero turned something else entirely. I don't want to spoil too much. Um, and this book offers a very different perspective. This book also has a recurring cast, a lot of recurring cast from the first series, and so it feels like it's trying to balance the old with the new. In my opinion, it's doing a fairly good job of that, but it has a very different feeling to it than Memory, Summer, and Thon. So if you have read the first series and you want to pick up this one, I just want you to keep that in mind. There are going to be different characters and there are going to be different characters to be slightly annoyed by, but then also find incredibly endearing, which is exactly what's happening with this one. So I'm enjoying myself, and we love to see it. <laughs> it's just, it's so heavy. I'm going to put that down. Jesus Christ. Right, so the second one that I'm currently in the middle of is actually not technically on my August TBR, but I've got this from Sarah, and I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm driving over to her place to visit her soon, and I want to give her at least this book back from the series because I also have the third one, and that is The Ikasar Falcon by K.S. Viloso, which is the second book in the Chronicles of the Bitch Queen. I have like 150 pages left, I want to say, roundabout. Um, the, the, the writing, the font is just incredibly small, and for some reason my brain does not compute, and I underestimate how much time this is going to take me. I'm not a hundred percent on board with the book. I think there's a big discrepancy between how the character is viewed by others versus how she views herself. And while I usually like characters like that, for some reason uh, the fact that it's written in first person and also some personal issues that I have with the book don't really make it into an intriguing character dynamic for me, but more almost annoying. And almost like the book is is characterizing her like the main character who's also called the Bitch Queen. Um, for some reason it just makes her seem like a very unrounded character and very flat. Um, but I am enjoying myself and whenever I sit down to read it I do get sucked into the world again so I do have hopes that this is gonna change even more. And I have the third book as well which is The Dragon of Jin Saeng and so I will be intrigued to see if these issues carry over for me within like up to the last book I would say or if um, I find myself suddenly really really loving these. Um, so well, well we will see what happens. Right, after those two are out of the way, um, I have two that I don't own physically because I got both of them from the library and both of them were audiobooks. The first one is, I believe it's called The Whispering Skull. Uh, it's the second book in the Lockwood & Co. series by Jonathan Stroud. This was a reread, or in this case re-listen for me, but this is the first time that I'm interacting with the English books instead of the German translations. And it, it's just a fun time. I usually listen, I listen to it while I was doing some other stuff as well, and I mostly just listened to it because I wanted to have background noise. That was not just music. 
Um, so I enjoyed myself, I had a fun little time as per usual. I think I gave it like around four stars because it was just an overall enjoyable experience. Um, and I did really enjoy the audiobook and how it was made up. And the second audiobook that I also got from the library is uh, Threads That Bind by Kika Hatsupulu. This is a new YA fantasy. I believe it's the beginning of a trilogy, but at the very least um, there's another book coming out. And I personally really enjoyed it. Um, I'm very critical when it comes to YA fantasy. Uh, and I sometimes feel very bad about that. But I really enjoyed myself with this. I didn't like that there was a lot of info dumping, which is something that YA fantasy tends to do, and I'm not the biggest fan of that. But the characters were fantastically written. I really enjoyed the, like, sister dynamics that Kika Hatsupulu put in there. And also, and this is entirely biased and doing the book a lot of favors, and I will not be backing down from this. I'm really happy that we're getting a like Greek myth inspired YA fantasy book that is actually written by a Greek author. <laughs> it's sad that this is, you know, it's sad that I'm so excited about that, but here we are. So yeah, I gave it, I think 4.5 stars or something around those lines. I don't have my notes with me right now because our internet is gone. It's, it's a struggle all over, but ignore that, but I really enjoyed my time with it and I thought the um, narrator was fantastic. So if you are an audiobook girly, gender neutral, and you want to pick this book up, I do recommend the audio because it was really great. Right, moving on. Uh, we have three more German ones that I very briefly want to talk about. We have Rowan and Ash. Um, this was a queer German fantasy book. Um, I enjoyed it. I had a good fun time with it. I liked the romance. I thought there could have been a lot more going on with this book, but like I already anticipated this to be a romanticy, and so I got exactly what I was asking for. It was not too deep. It was not overly shallow we were fine. Rowan and Ash and I, we were fine. That's probably the best I can say about that. Um, Grey by Leonie Swan. Uh, I think I very briefly talked about what I expected from this, and to be honest, I didn't exactly get what I was expecting because I thought that it was going to be from Grey's point of view, but it's not. It's actually from Dr. Augustus Huff's point of view. Um, I did enjoy the book getting into it. It was not my favorite, but I fully read it and Gray and I, we were, we were friends, I suppose. We were holding hands every once in a while. I don't yet know if I'm going to keep this because, again, this is one of the books from the pile of books where I'm not sure if I'm going to keep them or not and where I just want to give them a chance. And if we're not enjoying ourselves, they go. That's basically what's happening. And I don't yet know if Gray is going to go, but at least Gray is now red, so that's great. Next one, um, this one is a DNF. It's from the same... German books I want to give a chance, and that would be Bookman by Levi Tidar. Now, I, I knew that there was going to be a fridging of the wife, and it happened very soon, and then for some reason the main character who was supposed to be in love with this person and wanted to marry her uh, just didn't care anymore. I was very emotionally disconnected from the series, and it felt like he was emotionally disconnected from it, and that was just too much emotional disconnect going on for me. Um, and I feel like the book was trying to do so many things at once because it was trying to talk about like characters coming alive from specific books and it was trying to talk about a terrorist who is called the bookman who blows things up, which great. Um, and it was trying to talk about an origin story for Orphan, which, you know, we're, we're aware that this is probably not his real name and everything. But I think it was trying to do too much at once, and the writing didn't really help. I was severely disconnected from the story. I made it like a hundred pages in, and then I was like, you know what? The entire experiment is to give these books a chance and then toss them aside if I don't like them. So this is what happened to Bookman. Um, I do not have time and or space on my shelves to keep books and to continue to read books that do not interest me whatsoever. And it, I've, I've paid like two euros for this, so honestly... You know, we had a good run, you tried, you failed, it's fine. It'd be like that. So that is the DNF of the month at this point. And now... 
Um, I hope that I can do all of this with my battery. I might have to come back to this at some point. But anyway, um, I have two books here where I've done a review of. I will be linking that up there in the description down below. So first of all, we have the BBC National Short Story Award, and then we have my reread of Juniper and Thorn by Ava Reed. I loved both of these very much. Um, I think I gave this one 4.5 stars and this one 5 stars, simply because I didn't enjoy all of the short stories as much as I wanted to, which is to be expected of a short story collection, I will be quite honest there. And Juniper and Thorn is just perfection. It's, uh, I, I don't know what to say, it's, it's a gothic fairy tale retelling. Go read it if you haven't yet. <laughs> it's fantastic. Anyway, um, so the next uh, five star, I believe this is the second five star of the month for me, was The Vanished Birds by Simon Gimenez. I talked about the fact that I wanted to pick this book up because so many people were raving about the spear that cuts through water, and I was like, I cannot buy more books by the same author without knowing if I like the author or not. Well, spoiler alert, I really like the author and I want to get the spear cut through water now. Um, this book made me cry within the last few pages because it was so heartbreaking. The writing is beautiful, uh, show-stopping, wonderful. The concepts explored in this, specifically when it comes to time travel and like exploitation of the indigenous and exploitation of the world in general to like bring one small element of the populace further was fantastic. It was heart-wrenchingly horrible. All of the characters, but especially the the female ones that were at the forefront, were incredibly morally grey and incredibly... Do I like them because they could step on me? Or do I like them because they're genuinely good people? And the answer was a solid maybe in both cases. It was really well done. There's a lot of very casual queer representation in this as well. So if any of this sounds like something you would enjoy, I highly encourage you to pick this one up. It's also, it's, uh, it's a standalone. We love standalones. And honestly, if I had to describe this book in, like, the vibe of two other books slash series that I've really, really enjoyed, I would say this is the perfect love child between Becky Chambers, The Wayfarers, and Arcadia Mateen's A Memory Called Empire, or the Tykes Galan duology. Because it has this First of all, the beautiful lyrical writing style that rivals that of the Tykes Kalan duology, and I don't say that lightly because I love that duology so much. I'm going to be talking about this in one video because I really have to. It has that, it has the devastation of colonialization in space, even though it doesn't focus as much on that as uh, the Tykes Kalan duology does, but it also has this very, very casual queer representation that Becky Chambers is so incredibly well known for, and it has this this tendency to focus on one small person as opposed to the grand big picture, which is also something that Becky Chambers explores without, um, while still keeping in mind that even a small individual can change the pace of like an entire empire or something like that. So I, I loved it. It broke my heart. What am I supposed to do with myself now? Anyway, moving on <laughs> to the last but not least book of the ones that I've already finished in August 23. Every single time I remember it's 23, I want to die inside. Anyway, the one that I finished as well is The Awakening by Kate Chopin. This one has The Awakening as well as some short stories by her in there. Um, I can give you the names real quick as well. So we have The Awakening, we have Desiree's Baby, we have Lilacs, Miss McEnders, and a pair of silk stockings. So that's five, well, four short stories and one novella essentially in total. This is about 200 pages. Um, I really enjoyed this. First of all, trigger warnings, racism abound. This was written uh, in the 19th century, I think you're at the end of the 19th century more or less, so start of the 20th century. So much racism. Um, <laughs> she does, Kate Chopin does explore that every once in a while, um, and she is also the daughter of, what was what, what it? Uh, a French Creole mother, but again, Approach it with caution, especially if that is a trigger for you, which I fully understand, especially for people of color. Um, approach it with caution. 
at least she calls it what it is, I suppose, every once in a while, because like a lot of, of white classics completely ignore any and all of that, but is she the best person to tackle these, to these topics? I'm not entirely sure. Um, but she does talk a lot about female empowerment, well not necessarily empowerment I would say, but the female condition in a way. And while I did a bit of research, while Kate Chopin herself never really considered herself a feminist, a lot of her work, including The Awakening, is seen as basically like deeply feminist literature. Uh, the Awakening talks about uh, a woman who essentially discovers her sexual awakening by uh, ultimately having an affair with another man uh, that is not her husband, and it talks a lot about this uh, discrepancy that women felt at the time, and sometimes still feel today, obviously, between being a nice housewife, essentially, but also being their own person. Um, and there's a lot of distinctions made here between the fact that she is a mother, but she doesn't feel motherly and all of those things. Um, and while I don't feel the book condones cheating, this is obviously what happens. I personally feel like the book tries to treat the subject with the gravitas it deserves, but it also very heavily goes into this whole idea of women not knowing where their place could possibly be if they start disobeying their husband. Um, one very small thing that I noticed, for example, is that our main character, um, who is called Mrs. Pontellier, is only called by her first name a few, I think like two or three chapters after she was introduced for the first time. So the book very succinctly circle centers her family name, aka the name of her husband, before centering her, before giving her a stage. And I feel like through subtle ways like that, Kate Chopin makes it incredibly obvious how women were treated at the time and how devastating that could have been. Um, by the way, in case you didn't know yet, this book also had like a massive controversy surrounding it because of the like empowerment of female sexuality in a way, quote unquote. Um, and another fun tidbit is, if you read Lilacs, it reads very gay. <laughs> I believe, if, if, if I did my research right, a lot of, of people, like specifically from the sapphic community, also refer back to Lilacs as one of the reasons why purple is such a prominent color in uh, lesbianism and uh, sapphic cultures. So, you know, that's just a side. Uh, I think The Awakening in and of itself um, is a very great classic to start yourself on if you're not fully familiar with classics, especially classics from like somewhat later times. Again, this is late 19th, early 20th century um, because the writing style is relatively simple and straightforward um, and it is also pretty short, so that's nice. And if you want to start even shorter, I recommend starting with some of the short stories that are also in this collection. I personally really enjoyed Lilacs, but I also think that um, Desiree's Baby, while being devastating and also, again, somewhat racist. Anyway, um, they're good starting points if you want to start enjoying classical literature from later on in any kind of different writing periods. Uh, because they are very, fairly easily understood and they're also fairly short, so that's nice. Right, um, with that, I'm actually done with the books that I've read so far in August. Um, I think I, ha I, had a, I had a great reading experience so far. My book experiment of trying to get rid of books on my shelves is going somewhere, going strong, question mark, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> But apart from that, um, I had some really great experiences with some of the books I've read. I had a few, two, actually five stars. I had a few uh, four stars, like for example, The Awakening. I had uh, a lot of experiences in between. I think the lowest I rated anything, apart from the fact that I DNF'd Bookman, was actually Rowan and Ash with 3.75. I love Storygraph for doing the 0.75 and 0.25, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so far the reading month is going great. We hope that this will continue. I do have a few more, particularly I think two very rather big ones, which would be The Dragon of Jin Saiyang and also The Liar's Knot, which I do want to start. Um, but I will definitely keep you updated on that.
whenever the time comes. And until then, I hope that you have a nice reading experience as well. I hope that your August reading experience is going great and I will see you soon.